Good morning, and welcome once again to Fresh Vision Church here in El Paso, Texas. I want to thank you for also taking the time to watch this video or hear this message wherever you may be at, at whatever time of day it is. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send them to us. You can do that either by going through our website at fvcelp.org, or you can also share your comments or questions at the bottom of this YouTube or Facebook video. And just to give you a little bit of heads up, we are planning on opening our doors again next week on May 10th and resuming our live in-person church services. So keep us in prayer about that, and we are looking forward to seeing you all again. Well, today we're going to be in Luke chapter 15, and I've titled today's message, The Joy of Finding the Lost. Now this morning we're going to be covering three parables illustrating what it means to be lost, heaven's joy when the lost are found, and how the loving Father looks to save people. I hope that by the end of today's message it will be clear to you that there's one message of salvation. God welcomes and forgives repentant sinners. So as we go through chapter 15, I want you to ask yourself, if you're a lost sinner seeking salvation and a father's love, or are you standing aside watching and wondering how in the world the father could be so forgiving to foolish, careless, and rebellious sinners? So before we get into God's word, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that once again we are here. Um, I thank you for everybody that's watching and listening. I pray that you will bless them this morning, Lord, that they will hear this message and afterwards be radically changed, Lord, that the lost will be found and that many will be saved, Lord. So speak to us now, Lord, through this message. Remove all emotional, mental distractions now, Lord, so that we may focus completely on you. We now want to glorify you through the reading and hearing of your word. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, as I mentioned, we're going to be Luke chapter 15 this morning. Luke chapter 15. And the word of God says, All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together saying to them, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Or what woman who has 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Well, in both of these stories, Jesus sought to touch the hearts of every class of society who were in need of salvation. His intent was to help them to understand God's joy when the lost are found. But before we examine the parables, there's a few things I want you to no notice here in just the first two verses. First of all, I want you to notice who Jesus' hearers were. They were all the tax collectors and sinners. The tax collectors were one of the most despised groups of Jews, and the sinners included the ostracized and outcasts of society. The other group were the Pharisees and the scribes. And as you know, these were the pretentious religious leaders and legal experts who viewed themselves as morally and religious, religiously superior. Secondly, notice how they responded to Jesus. 
the tax collectors and sinners were approaching. Now, although Jesus disapproved of their sins, many of them acknowledged that he was right by coming to him, repenting, and following him. On the other hand, the religious leaders were complaining. They resented the fact that Jesus was associating with those they viewed as unworthy of love, attention, and mercy. And then thirdly, notice what they did. The tax collectors and sinners came to listen to him. Naturally, such people found Jesus and his teaching attractive. They wanted to hear more and to see what Jesus would do for them. Whereas the religious leaders were the ones who were doing all the talking. They continually chided him. Why are you hanging out with these kind of people? Don't you know who they are? They'll ruin you and make you unclean. Now the first story that's told here is mostly known for the numbers involved. In this hypothetical situation that Jesus puts before his listeners, he imagined a man with a hundred sheep. Ninety-nine were safe with him and secure, while one had become lost. Now in real life, most shepherds wouldn't have taken the time or they wouldn't have risked leaving the 99 in the open field to go after the lost one. Yet this particular shepherd cared so much for all of his sheep that he had to go find the one that was unaccounted for. When he found it, he joyfully placed it on his shoulders and then took it back home. Once there, the shepherd calls his friends and neighbors to rejoice with him because he had found his lost sheep. Here, the Lord is pictured under the symbol of a shepherd. The 99 sheep represent the scribes and the Pharisees, and the lost sheep represented either one of the tax collectors or a sinner. So what the Lord is saying here is that he's actively seeking the lost. Seeking them not in an irritated or annoyed manner, but rather in a concerned and caring way. Also, keep in mind that Jesus pictures himself as the one pursuing, finding, and retrieving the lost sinner, not the other way around. Another noticeable and important aspect to this story is what happens after finding the lost sinner. He feels joy, carries it home and lets everyone know about it. So not only does this speak of a Savior's joy in seeing a lost sinner repent, but also reveals that a saved sinner is now at a place of privilege and intimacy. A kind they never knew or had while they were part of the larger group. You see, 99 sinners who have never been convicted of their lost condition won't understand what joy feels like. Jesus' story here emphasizes how much God cares for every lost sinner and how joyfully he responds when each one is found. But there's also joy in the person who does the finding. Now, in case you might not know, a wonderful joy is felt whenever a Christian, whenever a believer leads a sinner to faith in Christ. But not only do we feel it, but others feel it as well. They rejoice with us when we share the good news of how God used us to adopt a new child into his family. And we must always keep in mind that there's also joy in heaven. The angels know better than we do what we are saved from and to and they rejoice with us. The next parable is remarkably simple and reiterates the same basic point as the parable of the lost sheep. In this second parable, Jesus tells the story of a woman who had saved a portion of her salary and had amassed 10 silver coins. Now some scholars have suggested that these 10 coins might have been part of a headband that Jewish girls wore signifying that they were married. But either way, a loss of one of these coins would have been considered a calamity. Well, indeed, tragedy struck when this woman loses one of her precious coins. 
At this point, she's faced with the same dilemma as a shepherd. That she spent time and energy looking for the one coin when she still has nine left? Of course she will. So, determined to find it, she diligently sweeps the entire house in search of it. She even lights a lamp to carefully examine everything that the broom will reach. Finally, after all the care and effort she put into looking for it, she finds her lost coin. She then reaches down, snatches it up, and then calls her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her for finding what she had lost. Now, out of the various interpretations of this parable, let me share the one that I believe makes the most sense. The woman in this story may represent the Holy Spirit, seeking the lost with the lamp of the Word of God. The nine silver coins speak of the unrepentant, whereas the one lost coin suggests the man or woman who is willing to confess that he or she is out of touch with God. Furthermore, the fact that the coin is an inanimate object could also be seen to represent the lifeless condition of an unbeliever who's dead in their sins. The woman's reaction to finding the coin is meant to make the point that God rejoices when a sinner humbles themselves, repents, and confesses their lost. So just like the first story, God's joy is so intense that it brings celebration and joy to his, to his angels in heaven. Now let me ask you, does this bring the same joy and celebration to you? Do you share God's feelings of love and pity and care for sinners? Is your heart so heavy for them that their repentance swells your heart with joy? Hopefully, this week, the results of your witness will flood heaven with joy. Well, these two parables help us to understand something of what it means to be lost. To begin with, it means being out of place. Sheep belong to the flock. Coins belong to the chain. And lost sinners belong in fellowship with God. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will freely forgive. But to be lost also means being out of service. A lost sheep is of no value to the shepherd. A lost coin has no value to the owner. And a lost sinner cannot experience the beautiful joy that God has for them in Christ. If this is you, James chapter 4, verses 8 and 10 says this, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. So, if you currently find yourself out of place or out of service, recognize your lostness and cry out to the Lord, and He will come find you. The Lord our God declared this in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 16. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, and strengthen the weak. I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them with justice. Well, in the next parable that we're about to read is one that many of you are probably familiar with. The parable of the lost or the prodigal son. So let's go there now. Let's go to verse 11 and read this wonderful story and see what new things the Lord wants to show us through it. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. He, being Jesus, also said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the shared 
the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of the country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat and fill, he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants or one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while, while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told the servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants que questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, I have been slaving many years for you and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could go celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, now that we've read this story, let's examine it closer by breaking it down into three parts. That of the youngest son, the gracious father, and the oldest son. In verse 12, the first part of verse 20, Jesus tells us about the experiences of the youngest of two sons. This part begins with the youngest son selfishly requesting from his father his share of the inheritance that he had coming to him. Now, according to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 7, the oldest son was to receive twice as much as the other sons. And if the father wished, he could distribute his wealth at any time. So, although it was perfectly legal for the younger son to make that request, it was foolish and insensitive on his part. See, by asking for his inheritance, it was as though he was saying to his father, I wish you were already dead. Well, because of the father's great love, he relented and distributed his assets to his sons. And not long after receiving his portion, the young man gathered together all that he had and split. He left Dodge, he left town, and now that he was far from home and family, we then learn that he squandered his money in foolish living until all of it was ine inevitably spent. Completely broke, things went from bad to worse when a severe famine struck that country. So with nothing to fall back on and no one to help him, the young man was thrown into virtual slavery, slavery by working at a pig farm by working among animals that he wasn't even supposed to look at or touch or have anything to do with. Then one day, he found himself craving the pods that the pigs were eating. And in that moment, surrounded by pig food, mud, and feces, 
that young man realized that he had reached the end of his rope and life couldn't get any lower. Not only was he probably experiencing severe hunger for the first time in his life, he also realized how lonely he was, how broken he was, and how empty he was. And it was at this point that he came to his senses and began to take the necessary steps to get his life back in order. First, he realized that he needed to go to his father in repentance, acknowledge his sins, and seek forgiveness. This meant that he'd have to own up to the condition of his heart and the consequences of his actions. Next, he exhibited genuine humility when he concluded that he was no longer worthy to be called a son and was willing to accept the status of a hired worker. And finally, he took the necessary action to follow through indeed from the intentions of his heart. He got up and went to his father. I recently read a quote that said, when you come to the end of yourself, you find the beginning of God. Now from this point, the second character of our story comes into the picture. In the second half of verse 20 through verse 24, Jesus gives us a little more insight about the compassionate father. Now, by saying in verse 20 that while the son was still a long way off, the father saw him, the Lord may have been suggesting that the father kept looking for his son, never giving up hope that he'd come back and be part of the family again. Well, when that day arrived and he saw his youngest son, he wasn't angry and he wasn't disappointed. Rather, it says that he was filled with compassion. In the Greek, the word compassion is the same one used in Matthew 9, 36, where it says that when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. So when he saw his son approaching, shamed, ragged, and gaunt, he was deeply moved, and his heart was filled with love and affection. The father's next reaction shouldn't surprise any father of any age who truly loves any of his children. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. Daringly, Jesus pictured God not waiting for his shamed child to slink home, nor standing on his dignity when he came, but running out to gather him to his welcoming arms. There's a Spanish story of a father and son who had become estranged. The son ran away and the father set out to find him. He searched for months to no avail. Finally, in the last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On that Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. Now, in spite of the joyful welcome from his father, it didn't deter the young son from what he was determined to say and do. So he re repeated the plea that he, had that he had rehearsed. But the father's love and compassion wouldn't permit him to accept the terms that his son was offering. He didn't even allow him to go as far as proposing becoming like one of the hired workers. You see, the father wouldn't let him apply for the job because he was absolutely intent on fully restoring all rights and privileges he once had as a son. The young man was then clothed with the best robe, given a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and his return was celebrated with a feast. The father's justification for his celebration revealed the severity of the son's condition before 
his repentance. He was dead and was lost. To now the complete restoration of his condition since his repentance, he is alive and is found. The father's statement made the application of this parable clear. Sinners are dead and lost, but they can come back to life and can be found if they return to the Father. Now, in a sense, this parable was complete, but the attitude of the Pharisees needed to be addressed directly. So he does this through the third character of our story. In verses 25 to 30, we're told about the oldest son's reaction to the events taking place when he was made aware that, the younger, that his younger brother had returned and that a welcome back party was underway, he became angry and resentful. He then began complaining about the many years he worked hard without ever disobeying his father's orders. Well, his hearers knew this echoed the attitude of the legalistic Pharisees. So it was obviously clear by now that the older brother represented the religious leaders. You see, they also resented that God was being merciful to the outrageous sinners. In their minds, they served him faithfully and never disobeyed his commandments, and yet had never been properly rewarded for all of this. Now, it should also be noted that the accusations that that older brother was making against his younger brother were speculative at best, and defamatory at worst. You see, there's no mention of prostitutes anywhere in the story. It only says that he squandered his estate on foolish living. So unless he snuck away from his duties, abandoned his father, um, went to the same distant country, and visually saw his brother's actions, he had no proof and was thus making it up. Furthermore, if you think about it, the attitude he was displaying wasn't significantly different from those of his younger brothers before he had left. A big indication of this was when he whined about how he would have liked to have been given a goat so that he can celebrate with his own friends. Thus, in his heart, he wanted his father to give him what he thought he rightfully deserved and have a good time without his father being around. So you see, the two weren't so different after all. Now, imagine for a minute what would have happened if the prodigal son had been welcomed by this self-righteous elder brother rather than by his merciful father. Because a lot of prodigal people are greeted by elder brothers, by self-righteous Christians, they think they cannot go home to the father. That forgiveness and mercy is too much to hope for, and that their only choice is to return to the pig slop of the far off country. May we never adopt such attitudes towards anyone who has left the faith and is now wanting to return. Regardless of who they are or what they've done to you, love them and welcome them home. Always remember what Jesus commanded in John chapter 15, verse 12, love one another as I have loved you. In the last two verses of this parable and chapter, the Father's grace, kindness, and compassion is seen once again. His pleas to his older son, reiterating his earlier words about the younger son's pre- and post-repentant states were largely lost on the bitter and resentful older son. Interestingly, though, no conclusion to this exchange between the father and the elder son is given. However, Jesus allowed the Pharisees to determine their own conclusion. They could continue to resent that Jesus welcomed tax collectors and sinners, or they can drop their bitterness and join the celebration as repentant sinners themselves. Unfortunately, we know that they chose to hold on to their resentment. But if they had only been willing to repent and acknowledge their sins, then the Father's heart 
would have been gladdened and they too would have been the cause of great celebration. The Lord also leaves it up to us to determine how we would respond. Are you the younger brother needing to repent, seek reconciliation and forgiveness? Then take the necessary steps to restore that broken relationship by admitting you messed up, genuinely humbling yourself, and then doing it, coming to the Father with a sincere heart. See, here's the thing. If you're out of fellowship with God, you cannot be in fellowship with your brothers and sisters. And conversely, if you harbor an unforgiving attitude towards others, you cannot be in communion with God. Or are you like the father who was sinned against and were tempted to respond in hatred and and alienation? When those that have wronged us show true repentance, we must forgive those who sin. And we should also seek to restore them in grace and humility. Paul wrote this in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's sins. In this way you will, be, will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else for each person will have to carry his own load. Or are you the elder brother? Like the self-righteous Pharisee refusing to have anything to do with the sinful younger brother. As Christians, we should carefully consider our attitudes as of our current age and culture such as addicts, those in sexual sin, and criminals. We ought to find ways to reach them as Jesus did, and or be slow to criticize or question the motives of those who are seeking to minister to them. Each of these three portions of the parable presented here in Luke chapter 15 speaks of a different aspect of sin. The sheep were lost due to foolishness. The coin was lost due to carelessness of another. The son was lost due to rebelliousness. Virtually every sin can be categorized in one of these, one of these three characteristics. Sometimes we make foolish mistakes. Other times, as in the case of child abuse, the sins of others leave their marks on us. And oftentimes, we're intentionally and willfully rebellious. Now most people can be very understanding toward any two of the three reasons for sin but become an elder brother regarding a third. And it's a different third for each person. Some people see a brother caught in a foolish sin and their heart goes out to them. Or they'll see someone hurt by an unloving spouse and will offer help and healing to them. But when it comes to rebelliousness all they can say is you should have known better. Others say, I can relate to the rebel. I know what it feels like to hear the call of a far off country. And I can relate to the one who makes foolish mistakes. But why can't those who are abused just get over it and move on? Still others can relate to the one who's lost because of another's carelessness or to the one who stubbornly chooses to walk in rebelliousness. But they can't figure out how someone could be so dumb as to wander off in foolishness. But here's the good news. The Father feels compassion for all three. Our God doesn't say to the foolish, you idiot, or to the one who was abused, grow up, or to the rebellious, you're getting what you deserve. No. He runs to meet all three equally the moment they turn to him. That's the kind of God that we serve. So the question I now want to ask you is this. Are you lost? 
Are you lost and do you want to be found? If that's you, then I want to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're ready to acknowledge you're a sinner, to repent of your sins, to humble yourself, and to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then with all sincerity, pray this from the bottom of your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, then welcome home. Welcome home and let's celebrate. Tell us about it. Call us, write us, send us a comment, send us a message. I want to hear from you. I want to help lead you into your next steps of faith. We want to maybe help you find a church or we want to invite you to come here to our church here. Ladies and gentlemen, there is absolute joy when the lost are found. And I hope that if you're a believer and you're watching this message that that you will go out and help lead people to faith in Christ. That you will experience that joy and that you will celebrate alongside God and all his people in knowing that another person is now saved and born again. I hope this message has spoken to you in one way or another. And I hope there was something here that you can apply into your own life. I used to be a prodigal son myself, and I had come to the end of my rope. I had hit rock bottom, and I had to make a choice. And I remembered this story, and I did exactly as this son, as this son did. And by God's grace, he brought me back in and restored me. And now, I'm here where I'm at because of him. This can be you too. Get up, make that decision, and come to the Father. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this message you've given us. I pray for those who pray that prayer to receive your Son as Lord and Savior. I pray that they will draw near to you, they will come to you, they will feel your embrace, that your, your love, Lord, your compassion and your mercy. Lord, I pray for those that have backslidden, those who have walked away, those who have, are living in rebelliousness right now, Lord, and who are at the end of their rope, who have hit rock bottom. I pray that they will come to the cross, look up, and be restored by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to remain humble. Help us to remain vigilant. Help us to remain solid. Help us to remain salt and light wherever we're at. Use us to be your witnesses. Use us to testify of your love and your mercy and your compassion. Thank you so much for giving us your Son that we now have the forgiveness of sins and that we're now reconciled with you. Lord, bless everyone's weak. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy, Lord. We pray for the city of El Paso and that you will continue to flatten this coronavirus curve, Lord. And we pray that once our doors are open again that that those that you've called here will come and feel welcomed as a family member. We thank you for all you've done and all that you will continue to do. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you once again for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week.